Hello dear listeners, dear viewers, my name is John Consumilder, your television host for Healing Sound Movement Television. Uh, go to HealingSoundMovement.com, also check out our peace initiative WorldPeaceChild.com. I'm talking English, well I'm trying to talk English here, because we have a uh, quite esteemed guest, it's a personal honor and a privilege, and uh, before we introduce to the show, just for some background, uh, his name is Bruce Lipton, he's an internationally recognized leader in bridging science and spirit. He's a stem cell biologist and he's best-selling author of The Biology of Belief, a very important book. I wrote about it even in my book Blueprint, which is Dutch, uh, Blauwdruk is a Dutch term. The same publisher, Ank Hermes in Holland. Uh, he also uh, is a recipient of the 2009 Goy Peace Award, so I thought that was interesting. Been a guest speaker on 100 TV and radio show, now 101, the 101 monkey effect probably, as well as a keynote presenter and National, for national and international conferences. Well, we won't need this anymore because our guest is here today, or we are here at our guest place, so to speak. So welcome, Bruce, John, thank to you the very show. much. Thank you very much, and uh, hello to everybody out there, and I hope we have some wonderful things to share with them. I guess we already did our epigenetics, so yes, to speak, hey. while we were in the, in the lobby. Um, we have this book here, and let me show it to the, to the people at home. It's of course your bestseller, The Biology of Belief. In Dutch, that is The Biologie van de Overtuiging, published by Ank Hermes. And I believe Hay House did the original publishing yes. for the English one? Yes. Okay, you have other books, of course, uh, the, something with fractal evolution and a new book, Natural Spontane Evolution. Spontaneous Evolution. Spontaneous Evolution. Yeah, uh, because uh, this is an event that the world is experiencing right now. We're already going through an evolution, and that's what people feel in the in the pit of their gut something is going on something is changing and the uh, fact it is is that uh, the world as we know it civilization as we know it is coming to an end mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I tell people the good news and the bad news I say well the bad news civilization as we know it is coming to an end and I say what about the good news I say oh the good news civilization as we know it is about to end yeah. uh, and the reason why this is important is because uh, science has recognized that uh, we are going through what they call the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet. Five times in the history of this planet, uh, life got wiped out. And uh, like when the dinosaurs disappeared, that mm. was one of the times. Uh, five times in history, life got wiped out and started over again. Uh, it was due to things like comets or asteroids coming in and hitting the earth and destroying the environment, and that's what killed the life. The sixth mass extinction is the one we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Science is saying we're losing species of organisms faster than ever in history. Yep. And that includes us on the list as well. Well, why, why this is important is that science says that the extinction we're facing is due to human behavior. Yeah. The way we treat each other, the way we treat the planet. We are not a sustainable species Not right sustainable. Now. And so uh, we're, it, it, then civilization coming to an end is very important because it's the way we have been living mm. that has caused the extinction. So that when, uh, if we end this way of living and begin a new way of living, there's an opportunity to survive and evolve through this uh, chaos that we have now. Talking about chaos, chaos theory is in a way a theory that says if you have optimum chaos, you have optimum opportunity for change, right? Absolutely, it's very interesting. People think that chaos is like random or accidental. It's like, no, chaos has a pattern, but you can't see it very easily. Uh, it's different than random. Uh, so uh, people should recognize chaos does have a meaning behind it. It does have organization. But there's an organization, pattern. but it's, for most of us, we can't see it because yeah. uh, it's fine details that yeah. we don't see. But it means that what's happening is not an accident. What is happening is part of a bigger plan and a bigger vision. What is the bigger plan? Our evolution. Mm -hmm. That we must learn to uh, treat each other differently and the planet differently for us to survive at this point. And right now we, we see crises all over the world. We see uh, economic crisis, uh, fuel crisis, uh, pollution crisis, climate change crisis. Energy uh, crisis. We can go yeah. list and make a list, but the point is 
all those crises are part of one crisis, and that is our evolutionary crisis that we're facing right now. And our ethics. Uh, exactly. It's because well, we haven't really learned who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we feel that we're like genetic machines, uh, at least the way medicine tells you uh, you're like a biochemical body with genes controlling that. And it turns out that's not true at all, mm -hmm. that there is uh, more to us than this body, there, yeah. that there's an energy in the field, uh, a spirit, so to speak. Yeah. And that uh, this is more powerful because we can change our genetics so we're not the victims of our genes. Mm -hmm. Most people see their lives as uh, their heredity controls who they are. Like yeah. if there's cancer running in the family, then they expect to get the cancer or Alzheimer's or diabetes. And it turns out those diseases mainly come from the conscious mind and the subconscious yeah. mind. Well, as you can tell, I am a victim of my genes because <laughs> I have two long sleeves all the way. But we're talking about the DNA. So the yes. DNA is like the blueprint, but only in a limited sense because it's the environment surrounding that blueprint, that DNA, and also the non-local, and maybe we can explain it to the listeners as well, past time and space, so to speak, the non-local connections of field energetics outside of the body. Absolutely. But, but it's the environment that counts, right? Right. Because what most of us have been programmed from conventional science that genes control our traits. Well, genes are blueprints, that's mm. a fact. But what we now know is that the mind uh, and the environment can alter the reading of those blueprints. So how we live our life and where we live our life and what we do in our life changes our genes. Yes. So like uh, we now know, for example, when identical twins are born, they came from the same egg and they are supposed to have the same genes working. Yep. And when they look at the genes of, the, of uh, identical twins, at the moment they're born, they, both twins have almost the same genes working in each one. Mm -hmm. But they look at the, the genes of one year, five years, ten years, twenty years later. And every year of life, the genes from the twins get further apart, different genes. Because of life experiences. Life experiences. See, so the idea that these are your genes and this is your life, that's, that's a false statement. Mm. These are your genes and they change with the way you engage your life. Mm -hmm. So if you are living in harmony with the world, then your genes are in harmony with your body and you're healthy. But when we start living out of harmony, when we're not living uh, 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 a life that conforms to the rest of the world, like the environment and all mm -hmm. that, uh, then at that point illness and sickness comes into the system. And it's not because we are sick, it's because of the environment that we're in. Dis-ease. Dis-ease. So mm -hmm. it says that we can heal ourselves, but uh, not through the drugs. The drugs are not, the, the drugs are toxic, the, mm -hmm. the medical profession. Uh, not the medical practitioner, yeah, yeah. the corporate medical thing, the, like the, the pharmaceutical itself, yeah. industry and all that. Yeah. Uh, these are corrupt industries and they are using us to make money mm. and they're making us sicker mm. because um, it's a profit game. When did you find this all out? Because you're a cell biologist. I believe you were involved into uh, cloning stem cells even way before science itself understood they were important, right? Maybe before you were born, John. Am I, dead? am I dead old or young? Oh, I, 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 did it, or? I did it that long ago. Let's just say yes. I yeah. did it very yeah. long ago. I was cloning stem cells in 1967. I think you're right. One year before I got born. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I was cloning them. And yeah. um, I was teaching in a medical school. Yeah. And I was teaching the medical students a story about genes controlling life, the conventional story. Yeah. But I was working with the stem cells in a Petri dish, in a plastic dish. And what I do is I put one stem cell in a Petri dish and it divides every 10 hours. Mm -hmm. So after two weeks, I have thousands of cells in the Petri dish, but they all came from one cell. So they were genetically identical. Mm -hmm. So now I have thousands of genetically identical cells, but I split them up into three different Petri dishes. Mm -hmm. And I change the environment, which is the culture medium. Yeah. So I have a different environment in each dish, three different dishes. And in one dish, the cells form muscle. In one dish, the cells form bone. And in the third dish, the cells form fat cells. I said, yep. wait, what, what controls the fate of the cell? Nature versus nurture? Yeah, well, the point was, look, they were all genetically identical when I yep. put them in the dish. So you can't say the genes did this because exactly. they all had the same genes. Yep. The only thing that was different was the environment. Mm. And if I, if I take my plastic Petri dish and take it from a good environment and move it to a bad environment, the cells get sick. 
Mm. And you might say, Bruce, uh, what kind of drugs should you give the cells? And I say, you, you don't give the cells any drugs. Mm. All you do to make the cells well is you take them from the bad environment, move them back in the good environment, and they automatically become well. Yep. So the health of a cell is a reflection of the environment. Yep. And so while well, we live in bad environments and we get ourselves sick, we take a lot of drugs. This isn't helping us. What we need to do is move or live in a better, healthier environment, mm. and then we will become healthy without drugs, okay? Now, you say, but Bruce, you're, you know, you're talking about cells in a plastic dish. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, here's a in story. Vivo, in vitro, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and here's a story. We look in the mirror, John, you look in the mirror, you see yourself, one human looking back, you say one organism, and I go, that's a mistake of perception. Mm -hmm. Because you are actually made out of 50 trillion cells. The cells are the living entity. When you say me, you're talking a community. So when I say me, Bruce, that's 50 trillion cells. And so here's a funny but true understanding. Yeah. A human is like a skin-covered Petri dish. Under my skin, I got 50 trillion cells with culture medium called blood. Yeah. And what did I show? If it's a plastic dish or a skin dish, it doesn't make a difference. It's a culture medium that controls the fate of the cells, right? Mm -hmm. So I say I take the plastic dish from a good environment, put it in a bad environment, the cells get sick, you want to make them well, move the plastic dish back in a good environment. Then I say the same thing with a skin dish. If I take my skin-covered Petri dish yep. and move it into a bad environment, then I get sick. And you say, well, what kind of drugs? And I go, ah, that's the problem. No, not the drugs. What you need to do is take your skin dish and move it back into a better environment. Yeah. Then you get healthy. This is where our power comes from. Don't we are change it. Powerful. Don't change the space suit. Change space. That's exactly that's exactly what it is, John. It's a good mm -hmm. way of saying it because most of us think we have to buy the drugs and the medicine. It's the drugs and medicine that are actually making us worse. Isn't the, the same mistake that well, medicine now, the reductionistic and mechanistic worldview and the scientific paradigm, isn't the same mistake Pasteur made talking about vaccines and the pharmaceutical industry's interest? Um, because Becham said it's the environment, the environment, and Pasteur used to say at his deathbed, I believe, send the par le microbe, c'est le milieu, environment again. Yes, and you know who also said that? Charles Darwin. Mm. Because we get from the Darwin belief, oh, the genes control our lives. Yeah. But even when Darwin was, when he, before he died, when he was very old, he said, no, no, it's not the genes, it's the environment that does this. Yeah. So uh, even before he died, he changed his mind. But most yeah. science has always kept the genes as the control. But the new science, which you mentioned, uh, yeah. epigenetics, yeah. is a science that changes the whole world and the whole meaning. Because... When I say genetic control, that's what I was teaching medical students, yeah. genetic control means control by genes. Mm -hmm. When I say epigenetic control, it's a completely different thing. And people say, well, what's different? I say that little beginning, epi, E-P-I, mm -hmm. epi, means above. You could say epic. Yeah, it is. Epic it is. genetics. It's going to change civilization yeah. because if I, epi means above. So when I say epigenetic control, that means control above mm. the genes. So epi, epi means above because it's, above. It, it's like as above, so below. So that's, that's interesting. Right. Yeah, and, and so it, like epidermis yeah. means skin, but that's above the dermis, which yeah. is below. So epidermis above dermis. Epigenetics above the genes. So conventional science uh, uh, in the, what people have been taught, yeah. genes control my life. But the new science, epigenetics says, no, no, your mind and your perception and how you respond to life changes the genes. That's why the two twins, even though they were born with identical genes, mm. when they have their own lives and they have their own experiences, it changes their genetics so that when you look and compare their genes later, yep. they don't have the same genes working. Yep. So uh, we change our genes with the way we are living our life. I found something interesting. I think this will suit your, uh, your whole story. It's by Fred Hoyle. You probably know. Oh, yeah. It's from the Intelligent Universe. And it says, a junkyard contains all the bits and pieces of a Boeing 747, dismembered and in disarray. A whirlwind happens to blow through the yard. What is the chance that after its passage, a fully assembled 747, ready to fly, will be found standing there? So it's not that it's, it's there, it's the field effect and the interaction of those 
environment aspect that exactly. makes it an, an, a flying plane, yeah. right? Well, it's, it's interesting because um, conventional science, where I was teaching, uh, is based on Newtonian physics, which says the universe is a physical machine. Mechanistic. That it's mechanism. Everything you want to, anything that's physical is important. Anything that's not visible in Newtonian physics is not too important. Mm -hmm. Quantum physics comes in and says the invisible stuff, which they call the field, yeah. is more powerful in shaping the material physical world than is the mechanical world. Mm. So uh, from Newtonian physics, we emphasize the physical body, but the new physics, quantum physics says, no, you emphasize the invisible stuff, thought, energy, field. And Inf it, information. You say, information. You say, well, what's <laughs> field? What's the definition? So I, I like it because I say, the definition of field is invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. Yeah, it's a field of influence. Yeah, and interestingly, the, the definition for the word spirit is invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. So that quantum physics, the field, and spirituality are actually the same talk. Mm. So that we're moving back into a world of recognizing the invisible forces, the field around us. Mind into matter? Exactly, and so that's where our mind actually runs our biology. Mm. And so this is very powerful because when I tell you genes control your life, I say, did you pick the genes as far as you know? Mm. No. The, it, it, the genes control these traits. If you don't like your trait, can you change the genes? No. So I say, well, the old story of genes is you're a victim of your heredity. If they have cancer running in the family, then you're going to get cancer. you got diabetes in the family, you're going to get diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we become victims in that story. Yeah. But the new story of epigenetics, it's our mind and perception that control the genes. And that's Im important because you can change your mind, you can change your perception. And when you change your mind and perception, you change your own biology. Mm -hmm. So the point is, the old biology, you were a victim of genes. The new biology, you are a master because you can change your consciousness. Mm. And when you change your consciousness, you change your genetic activity. So you can control your own genes. So the old paradigm is deterministic and the new one has free will? Absolutely. It and it's it, a hopeful picture. Besides. It is a very hopeful picture because people have a lot more hopeful wishes and desires uh, than the world that we have right now. Mm. And now if we can turn those wishes and desires into power, then we would manifest a different world completely. What does this mean for the treatment of cancer and other uncurable diseases? Well, there are very few, very mm. few uncurable diseases. In fact, cancer only about 10% of cancer at most is heredity. Mm -hmm. That means 90% of cancer has to do with uh, lifestyle, consciousness, belief, and all this other stuff. Yep. What does it mean? 90% of cancer you can change by just changing the way you live. Yep. So we're not victims of cancer except the belief or the way we have been living. And this becomes issue. Now, you might bring up a, a thing that says, well, well, that's like positive thinking. If I just have some positive thinking, of course, I, I should be able to heal myself, but it doesn't work for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and, they, and the reason why is something that they didn't understand, and that is this. The mind has two parts, the conscious part, which is connected to our identity, our spirit, yep. the conscious mind, uh, is a very creative mind. The subconscious mind is like a tape recorder, it records experiences, so once you learn something, how to ride a bicycle, how to drive a car, how to tie a shoe, you don't have to relearn it, you could just push the button and play it automatically. It repeats the conditioning. It repeats exactly the way the program was in. Yeah. So now we find out a new thing from science. We only, uh, average person, at most uses the conscious creative mind 5% of the time, but the most of the life comes from the subconscious, 95%. Well, here's where the problem comes from. The word subconscious means below conscious. Mm -hmm. So when you're engaging these subconscious programs 95% of the time, you don't even see you're doing that. Mm -hmm. But then here's the really big problem, John, and that is this. The fundamental programs in the subconscious mind, we got them from our parents and our family when we were kids before six years of age. Mm -hmm. So it says, then the basic programs in your subconscious mind, you got from other people, not from you. You bought other people's beliefs, you bought other people's behavior, mm -hmm. put that in a subconscious mind. Then you think, oh, I'm running my life with my conscious mind. I go, that's what science says. No, only only five percent. So mm -hmm. the ninety-five percent of your life is actually running off of other people's beliefs. As the and are these correct? 
Well, that's where the problem comes up. If you learn an incorrect belief in your subconscious mind, then 95% of your life you're going to be playing that, that incorrect belief. But Bruce, this is very important because not just what you just said is very important and significant that there's a subconscious conditioning repeater player yes, recorder, yep. but also the implications of what you just said. It means if, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I know you will, um, does it mean, let's put it in a question, that if we become conscious of how to implement thoughts and feelings and emotions, intention, coherence, global consciousness, maybe world peace, that we become a critical mass of the right thoughts, the right emotions, the right outputting of fields, that we can change the whole perspective from health and, and healing the planet? Everything, the whole planet can turn upside down overnight by doing this. Now here's the interesting thing, because uh, we talked about, well, uh, we say, yeah, the mind is creating this world, and people look around and go, but this is not the world I, I yeah. want to create. And I go, well, yeah, because 95% is really coming from the subconscious, which is mm -hmm. other people's. And I would say then, what would happen if you actually ran your life from your conscious mind and mm -hmm. didn't use the other programs, right? Yeah. Well, here's the answer. Go back to a time you fell in love with somebody, big time, where you fell head over heels in love. Mm -hmm. And I say, when you go back, uh, were you healthy then? Most people go, yeah, I was really healthy when I fell in love. And I say, uh, did you have a lot of energy? And they go, oh, we had so much energy, we made love for days, didn't even stop for food. Yeah. I go, was life so beautiful when you were in that period that you couldn't wait for the next day to have more? Mm -hmm. And people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, when you were in love like that, wasn't that like making heaven on earth? And they go, yeah. And I Stay go, there. And I go, that mm -hmm. was not an accident. Mm -hmm. That was a creation because now science has also recognized this. When we fall in love like that, the conscious mind stays in charge and stays in control. Mm -hmm. So during what we call, I call it the honeymoon, it's because you're not operating from the subconscious program in that period. You're operating from conscious creativity. You're really creating. So you're actually, you, you mm. created heaven on earth. So here's the point. If we were all operating from our conscious minds, mm. we would all manifest heaven on earth. Yeah. But our minds work in such a way that 95% comes from the subconscious. Mm. And that's really programmed by other people. So the reality is, most people have already had the experience of what would life be like if you would create from your conscious mind and I say it's called the honeymoon yeah. and if we all started to learn how to do that then the whole planet would turn into the honeymoon so first realize that it's like this because change perception change, change reality right exactly what it's all about but you have to be careful because uh, we, we, we think we're operating from our beliefs and our wishes, mm. but it, it turns out it's a small percent that, turns, that operates that way. Let's talk about that, because some people say, well, we create our own reality. Yes, we do. And it is, it is true, yeah. but it is more complex, like most people think, I think. But then again, we have global consciousness. Yes. Might it be that our consensus reality, because that's a big, big thing, like how come this uh, chair is the same for me if I create it because did we make an agreement, we call it consensus yes. reality, might there also be that it's a reflection of our subconscious programming, that we have a consensus reality which doesn't look like paradise on earth and no. that we can change it. That, but that's the problem. See, we learn these experiences in the first six years of our life because uh, when we come into this world, let's say if you could be conscious, let's say you could be conscious the moment you were born, mm -hmm. and you were just coming out of the birth canal, and I see you and I say, John, you're welcome to the planet Earth, what, tell me something. Yep. And you would look up and go, I just got here, I don't know anything. See, so the idea is you can't be conscious unless you know something. Yeah. So the design of our biology, the first six years, the design of the brain is to record the experiences of the family and the, and the, and the community. Yeah. Well, these are where the consensus uh, uh, beliefs come from. We record the community's belief. Learning the language. We learn the language. We learn how to involve ourselves and become part of the community. You, so if the community says this is right, then we all say, okay, this is what we do. And if the yeah. community says this is what we do, then you do that. Yeah. So the idea is we were programmed by the first six years. Well, here's the problem. The, the program, programs have been running for generations. Mm -hmm. And the consensus of opinion of these beliefs have been passed from one generation to the next before we're even six. Yeah. So my subconscious program, the fundamental programs the first six years, are not my beliefs, they're consensus. Yeah, but if the consensus says the world is a struggle, or the world is, a, there's disease out there, or war is out there, and this is the way life is, if that's what I believe from my six years of life, mm 
-hmm. in my subconscious. When I'm an adult, even if my conscious mind says, I don't believe that, uh, science tells us, yeah, but you're not running from that mind. You're running from the, the subconscious one. That's the one that has the belief in the war and the violence and the sickness and all that. Yeah. So we keep propagating the consensus when it's time for us to learn something new, rewrite the programs mm -hmm. in our subconscious mind and start living the beliefs that we share. Because as I said, when people were given an opportunity to live from their conscious mind, yep. that's when they created the honeymoon. Yeah. So if we could all live from the conscious mind, then the whole planet would have that healthy look. Well, I think there's one positive outcome. That's why we do World Peace Child. We talked about it. Yes. That. And we have the song Prayer for the Children to sing in all different languages because we are not a very sustainable species right now as adults. But right. then again, the children are the future. And if we recondition, or we, not, not reconditioning, just conditioning them the right way and they, from the start, exactly. from new, we start a new civilization, right? That's exactly right. That's why I emphasize what I call conscious parenting. Yes. Meaning, look, you have to be aware that your infant, even if it looks like the baby is like, the baby's just born, you think, what, the baby uh, can't learn or anything like that. No, the baby is like recording, like a television recorder. It records all the sound, all the images. So it learning, even as an infant, Yep. And so if we have bad behavior, we are the role models. We're the role model and the infant is watching us and, and yep. becoming what we are. So we train the, the child. But then remember, we only use 5% from our conscious mind. So when we, even when we're being a parent, 95% of the behavior that that baby sees mm. is from our subconscious mind, which was what we learned from our parents who learned it from their parents yep. back. But this is important because we're now starting to talk about responsibility as yes. a role model, yes. uh, isn't this the same situation um, that if we become responsible for ourselves, we become the right models for our children, but talking about oneness and global consciousness, isn't the problem that we just now start to realize um, that we're all one, and if we understand we're all one, connected to the cosmos, Mother, Mother Earth, uh, other people, that automatically you start to understand that if we are one, we are hurting one another, I'm hurting myself, exactly. then the responsibility doesn't have to be learned, it's a natural thing, that pro natural evolution, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, we've reached this critical point that said the old learning that is in our subconscious minds and our behavior that we make is so destructive that we're creating our own extinction. Yeah. So the only way out is to put new learning into the system. And so people are waking up. There's a better way of living. There's a way to live in harmony, to make peace between people, peace between people and the planet, mm. so that we stop destroying the environment as well. So uh, all of this is happening right now because we have a very short time to make a change. If we don't make this change in the next number of short years, mm -hmm. uh, within 30, 50 years, this planet is going to look so completely different, it, it won't sustain life like it's doing now. It's going to be worse mm -hmm. unless we stop destroying the garden and actually start taking care of the garden. Do you have a feeling somewhere on a spiritual level, not just as a, a biologist, as a scientist, but also as a spiritual person, you have become because learning all this and finding yes, out that, yeah. you, that the implications also work for you. But um, do you have a feeling that consciousness is accelerating, that time or cosmic energies are helping out, facilitating maybe this consciousness shift is going on? Absolutely. There's an acceleration of our evolution because when you look at our history, there were very long thousands of years of very little change. And then the change started going faster and faster. So we live in a world that changes so fast that technology that comes out today that you say, oh, this is the greatest new technology yep. by next year will be outdated technology. So we're accelerating. And so this, this is an advance in our thinking and our consciousness. And we have to accelerate because we are indeed running against the clock. We, mm. the scientists have told us extinction is in our near future. It's the 11th hour. It is exactly a time that either we do this or don't. Mm. I mean, there's a man by the name of James Lovelock. Oh yeah. He's the, the guy, the Gaia hypothesis. Well, he's the one that recognized that the earth is a whole system, like a living system. Yeah. Uh, he's already said it's too late. Mm -hmm. He's, he, the founder of Gaia says, Gaia is, uh, is too late, it's terminal, Gaia is going to die. Mm. That, so some scientists have already given up saying that the end is, you know, we can't change it. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, the Bible says, in the kingdom of heaven, 
nothing is broken. Talking about our light bodies, yeah. the morphogenetic fields, yeah. these are different kind of information fields than matter, which is a persistent illusion of information transfer yeah. also. But might it be that the morphogenetic fields can still be cleared and healed and fed back as holographic imprinting on our world? Uh, absolutely. It's very interesting because the Earth is a living system. Yeah. And when I correlate that, I go back to people which we, we talk about a, a terminally ill patient. Like everybody says, oh my God, he's going to die. He's got cancer. Everybody writes him off. He's going to die. Mm -hmm. And then he has what they call a spontaneous remission. Yeah. And that means what happened? Well, spontaneously, the whatever the cancer was or whatever the illness was, it disappeared. And I say, well, what is responsible for these spontaneous remissions? When you go back and review all these people that have spontaneous remission, mm -hmm. one thing is common. They all had a change of belief, profound change of belief, like uh, like, like they would say, okay, look, uh, John, you, you got three months left. Go home, take care of your business. You're going to die in three mm -hmm. months. People in that position, some of them go, well, if I only got three months left, then I'm going to let go of all the stress. What the heck? Why not? Why not just go out yeah. and enjoy my three months? Yeah. They let go of the world that they lived in. They let go of all the, you know, the problems and the issues. And they say, I'm just going to go out and celebrate my last three months. Mm. Then it's four months. Then it's five months and six yeah. months. And they realize something. They got healthy. They got healthy because they let go of all of the stresses. The That's where the illness the came from. The bad news became good news. Absolutely. But that's only for a few people because yeah, yeah. they were the ones that said, "I'm, if I only have so much time, then I'm going to go out and enjoy my life. Most people mm. uh, buy the, the, the diagnosis, so look, you're terminal, you have so many days left. They believe that. Mm -hmm. And they die almost exactly on the day the doctor said. Yep. And you think, well, how did the doctor know what day they're going to die? The, the nocebo response. It's a, yeah, because if you believe you're going to die, then you set your mind up to die according to whatever the schedule is. And mm -hmm. you die on schedule because, because of belief. That's an interesting metaphor because... Um, might we say that it's the same for the for the, for the world we're living yes. in right now? Because it's chaos, it's crisis, it's down the drain. The world yep. is down the drain. But then again, it's great opportunity for for chance, a change, and transformation. Like the person who said, "Oh, I just have three months. Let's go living a different life," yeah. and it becomes positive. Yeah. And we have an opportunity for positive change as well. That's why my my my, my new book, After Biology of Belief, okay. is called Spontaneous Evolution. Yep. It's like spontaneous remission. It says we get to this critical point. If we don't change, the end is just as we're going to see it. But if we get to this critical point and say, look, we can't do this anymore. We're going to have to learn how to live differently and how to be healthy and you know, live in harmony and, and no more war, no more violence, get rid of all this stuff. It, the moment we make that change, mm. it's the same as that patient that says, okay, I'm letting go of all this other stuff. The earth will recover just like a, a, a spontaneous remission patient. Yeah. It can happen instantaneously. So we're because we change the environment aspects again. Exactly, and we're the, we're creating this, uh, yep. and uh, uh, and it's funny because for for a thousand years or more we've been told that we're just victims of forces outside of us. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the world, the uh, fate, uh, God, spirits, can you know? And it turns out yep. no, we are controlling ourselves. Now I understand the Hopi prophecy. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Exactly, and uh, and that's why there's more people waking up every day because we're getting to that point of we must make this decision to be different mm -hmm. because we're we're so close to that extinction. Mm -hmm. that if we don't, we could all disappear. I mean, this is not the first time there have been civilizations that have disappeared completely. I mean, Atlantis, mm -hmm. uh, even before that, uh, Lemuria. There were these civilizations that are no longer here. We know nothing about them. What happened yeah. to them? And I think, oh, they were just like us at this moment. Yeah. They're facing a, a reality that says, we can't sustain this, we're going we're gonna to go extinct. You know, the choice is, do we make a difference and survive, mm -hmm. or do we just continue to play it out, that's a choice, yeah. and we could die out. So look, uh, other, other civilizations have died out before. So yeah. it doesn't mean we're going to make it, mm -hmm. but I, I'm very hopeful because we have a, an ability to spread information and awareness the way this video is doing, yeah. getting it out to a lot more people, waking them up, and the more we wake them up, the more power we and are given. it could given. be done like this, huh? Absolutely. It's going to reach a critical 
number and then overnight it all changed. Just yes, like almost like holographic, like critical mass, just changing like in cymatics with the sound vibration. With the vibration. And all of a sudden the amplitude and frequency goes up and when it has a certain frequency window, so to speak, yeah. it just collapses, like the like quantum mechanics, collapses the wave factor, yeah. it becomes a different a kind different of thing pattern. all of a sudden. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing that uh, I anticipate is possible for us right now. Mm. And, and you can see that because you see individuals make these changes and, and, and just change their life almost instantaneously, walk away, become somebody different. Yeah. So these are very good signs. And a lot of people are watching other people saying, I, I see that they, they're doing something and I want that. Mm. And this is what is really great because enough people are really wanting to do something better than what we have. Talking about something better, let's go back to the physical body as well, yeah. the non-local physical body in a way, uh, talking about bioenergetics, scalar electromagnetics, bioholographics, that's yeah. all the new science showing that information transfer even at a distance um, and real cellular communication of light and bioacoustics, biophotonics and bioholographics are the world of vibration, sound, light and information yes. transfer even at a distance, non-local communications are the real biology in ourselves, digital biology. So can, can you tell us some more because you wrote in this book a lot about digital biology kind of uh, material. Yeah, well it, it's, it's, it's very scientific because it's the foundation of quantum physics. Biophysics. And, and quantum physics says, says that um, the invisible energy field is the primary shaper of the physical world. Well, all of a sudden that, you know, that Conventional science has not opened up to that. The conventional mm. science still, it's a physical world, you're a physical body, let me give you physical drugs and we'll do surgery and physical things. And yet we now know, wait, the invisible field, the energy, mm -hmm. is more powerful. And it's strange because all physics is fundamental in all kind of science except healing, right? Exactly, the healing sciences, and there's, there's a reason why it's money. Yeah. And the idea is this, if I could sell energy in a capsule, then the drug companies would sell energy medicine. They would, yes. But uh, if you, you can't sell it, in, uh, uh, then they have no business trying to offer it. So, mm -hmm. And the drug companies control medicine, not the doctors. Mm -hmm. So uh, the drug companies keep this information from the public. Because mm -hmm. if the public could become aware, you'd, you could heal yourself without the drugs. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that ruins that whole industry, that whole corporation. And also looking at the placebo effect, I mean, 30 to 70% of the medicine is information transfer also because it's about belief systems. Absolutely. And, and fake and, operations. And they recognize that, yeah. but they don't talk about it. Of course. And, and the fact is this, well, you would think if we already knew there was a mechanism where my mind could heal me, you would think, well, wouldn't science be studying this mechanism? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, no, science is not studying it because there's no profit for the drug company. Well, you know what, I, I got to tell a story here. As a neuropsychologist, I did a psychoneuroimmunology study. Yes. When I found out that suggestion, autofeedback, conditioning, humor, love, expectation, 1997, I wrote an article about that. And um, I talked to my professors, I said, you know what, it's all about suggestion. And they said, yeah, that's right, it's all about suggestion. So, but they, uh, two measures, so I mean, suggestion as an important process to be studied, yes. to be researched, and they said, no, it's all suggestion. I was like, come on, here is the data saying that our mind into matter can influence the immune system, can influence yes. blood, the pH value, all kind of parapsychological stuff, magical stuff yeah. in new science, and you do not want to research, and later on I found it was about money. Yeah, because uh, they say, well, you got to get a grant. I say, yeah. well, who gives a grant? Well, mainly exactly. the money comes from like the pharmaceutical people or the interest yeah. of that pharmaceutical company. Yeah. So that means if you do work that supports the drug company, you'll get the grant. If you do work like you wanted to do, yeah. nobody's going to pay you because there's no money for that. Yeah. Interesting, by the way, because you mentioned the work of Candace Pert in your yes. book. And I read uh, that work around 1997 because of that article I wrote. But the interesting shift she also made, like you, and I thought it was fascinating, she looked at psychoneuroimmunology, but it's still local in a way because it's in in the important membrane yeah. of the body, the skin, but now she also realized that it's, it's field effects even outside of the body. Yes. It's influences fields, non-local fields, right? Absolutely. It's what our interpretation of what's going yeah. on. So uh, if we have a, mis a misperception, an, an incorrect perception of life, and yet we send that into our body, we adjust our body not to the real world, but to the misperception. Yeah. And then now we're not even in harmony with the real world anymore. So the, most of the illness is just because we're not in, our perception is not in harmony with the world around us. Mm -hmm. 
I've interviewed not for TV but for Healing Sound Movement Radio Glenn Ryan, uh, oh, Glenn Winter, a dear friend of mine. And uh, so I, Dan, I thought I so because well, yeah. I, I think these guys and also Piotr Garyev, we also tried to get him over to Amsterdam as well with the DNA Phantom yep. effect. The Russian, they understand the energetics going on, and also Korotkov. So they're a bit of a field of the field, so yeah. to speak. But what I think is interesting is that there's so much science actually showing that these non-local effects and what you write about here, a brilliant book of emotion, heartfelt emotions, coherence, intention, that it, it changes the growth of things. So could we uh, learn children, the new people on this planet, so to speak, to work with positive emotions and thoughts to change the world? No, that's what we have to do. We have to first, we have to learn them ourselves so we yeah. can be good teachers. Our inner child has to learn yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, as I said, if you want to be a conscious parent, you want to make sure you're teaching all these wonderful skills to your children because that gives them power. You can make the strongest, most intelligent children in the world just by giving them the right background and encouragement. Mm -hmm. and, and the issue is, yeah, but uh, if we only operate from those visions 5% of the time, then we're not going to be very good parents because 95% yeah. of the time we're still going to play the old belief system. Mm -hmm. So to help the children, we have to first help ourselves. Yeah. We have to become better at who we are as humans. Could we say that our society now has an autoimmune disease? Absolutely, an autoimmune disease which by definition is self-destruction. Yeah. Uh, people are killing each other in the outer world and in the inner world when cells kill each other that's when we call it autoimmune disease. So the outer world is experiencing on a bigger level autoimmune disease with self-destruction of the humans and the planet. Mm -hmm. as well yeah so we and it's us that's doing it that's the important part about science it says mm -hmm. this is not happening to us we are creating this mm -hmm. so it's if we want to change it we can't wait for some god to come in and change it we're the one that created the problem we're the one that has to change mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about vaccines. I'm curious about your position. Your position before you wrote this book? And I was, well, before I was part of the medical community. <laughs> I guess so. And, and now I, I would never do a, a, a vaccine yeah. injection. Uh, there's a natural way to create immune response. It's mm -hmm. orally. Yeah. Because the system has what are called tonsils. Uh, and there's a big mistake about tonsils in the book. They say that's like uh, protection against the infection. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, no. Tonsils actually invite the infection inside. Mm. Tonsils bring them in so that they can learn about them. Tonsils are learning. So anything that comes in your mouth, your eyes, ears, nose, or anything has to go through by these tonsils. Yeah. And so um, that's why if, if, if you watch infants, they will stick everything they can into their mouth. Yeah. And, and this is not an accident, this is nature's way of vaccinating them. That's why they call it child's diseases, right? Uh, that's it, they put everything yeah. in their face, why? Because they're, when they put it in their mouth, the, their immune system is learning about it. Yeah. So, um, when healthy, healthy kids are the ones that play in the dirt and you know, get all outside and, uh, and they get all the germs and, and their system learns yeah. because it's a, learning occurs in the first few years. When you raise a child and the environment is too clean, mm -hmm. you actually interfere with the immune system. Because it's too sterile. It's too sterile. That's why some adults, if you get a disease like mumps or something as an adult, it's very dangerous as an adult, but you would have gotten it as a child. You would have handled it very easily and, and recovered very quickly and then mm -hmm. had uh, protection the rest of your life. So when you prevent uh, the children from getting exposed, like people, they clean everything so much, they actually pr promotes things like allergies and mm -hmm. asthma and stuff like that. That is a consequence of too clean an environment. Talking about allergies, isn't it interesting that most allergies can be actually brought about, produced by electromagnetic frequencies and can also be getting rid of, so to speak, also by using resonant frequencies? Right, or just the thought frequencies in your head because psychoneuroimmunology is the fact that says my belief system can cause uh, an allergic response and my belief yeah. system can cancel an allergic response. So yep. we really want to emphasize people's power that they possess, uh, but we've never programmed that power in normal childhood development. Mm. But this is a time now for change. This is to, as you talked about, let's create the children of the future with more power because they're going to need it mm -hmm. to deal with the with the the problems that we have created at this point. So mm -hmm. it's, it's important for us to see as parents that it's our responsibility to uh, help the children. How do we help and teach 
the parents and the scientists because the children are pure and can be conditioned yes. the right way. But yeah. you have an example of your fake uh, operation in your book. I have one also because I wrote that article in 1997 about psychoneuroimmunology. There was research opening up the chest to do a bypass operation. Yeah. And some people did not get a bypass operation. They just opened it up and zipped it again. Yeah. And those people were healthy also because they believed they were healed. But this is a manipulation. And of course, this is not an ethical thing to do. So they cannot do it anymore. No. But it's great to show that how powerful it is when you believe you are healed, you actually get healing. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because uh, we always used to think the placebo effect just had to do with drugs, you know, a pill. Oh, this pill is going to heal you, and then later you find it was a sugar pill. Yep. Now we find, as you just said, surgery could also be a placebo. Yep. So you could, uh, uh, they, when they used to do the, as in the book, I talk about the knee surgery, which exactly, is yeah. hundreds of thousands of them every year, and they, they did what uh, the fake operation. They just cut the, the little holes, but they didn't do anything. Yep. And the patients did exactly the same as the patients that had the full surgery. Yeah. So placebo applies not just to the drug, but to any of our life processes. Mm. I just read an article that, in fact, the placebo response is getting stronger and stronger. Isn't that interesting? Because more people believe in it. One of the greatest placebo stories is Prozac. Mm -hmm. Prozac went in a laboratory test, which the drug companies did not want to release uh, a, a scientist had to go in the United States to the government to force the drug company to release the data about Prozac. Prozac is the same as a sugar pill in a mm. laboratory test. It has no more power than a sugar pill to help you. But yeah. millions of people all over the world take Prozac and they, they swear that this Prozac is what saved their lives. And you were not so happy. I read. I just read that part of your book right now, uh, just just about two hours ago, that the pharmaceutical companies were researching the reactors to sugar to filter them out in the research so they could control yeah. the strong placebo effect, right? To yeah. manipulate that in the research. Yeah, because according to the rule, a drug is effective if it's better than the placebo effect. Yeah. Well. Placebo effect is always minimum one third anyway, no matter what. That's mm. why uh, Prozac works on one third of the people. That's mm. the that's the pro now, effect. It is an interesting thing, I think. I, it just pops up in my mind, so I have to ask you. Um, I followed a few parapsychological courses and conferences so on mind into matter, psychoneuroimmunology, bioenergetics. Then I thought someone said to me, John, you know, as a neuropsychologist, the most rigid, strong science is placebo-controlled, double-blind. I said, you know what? Say that to a psychic. How double-blind are you as a scientist if consciousness travels through walls and even through Faraday cages, which cancels out electromagnetic energies? How double-blind are we scientists if we think that placebo-controlled and double-blind is the way to go here? Well, again, uh, you, you hit on a topic that we built as a belief that this is a way to do it, and now we know with consciousness that consciousness can see through all of this stuff. So mm -hmm. the, the, the experiments turn out the way the experimenter uh, has a vision before they do the experiment. Yeah. This is very important. Um, there was an article in the British Medical Journal. They looked at research results based on who funded the research. Mm -hmm. And they looked at the same research, but whether it was funded by a drug company or by government public money. Mm -hmm. when, the when the drug company sponsored the, the research, the research came out five times more in the favor of the drug company. Yeah. A and then you say, well, did they cheat? And I go, no, it's just that that was their belief system. They already believed the drugs were going to work before they did the experiment. So that created, you know, that's part of the experiment. They, yeah. You believed that before you did it. Yeah. So uh, fields uh, of influences exactly what change the outcome. Yeah. 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 So uh, so uh, basically, all this research is not very. It's not. It's not, not it's, solid. It's not solid. It's contaminated <laughs> by the fact that a researcher is still part of the experiment. A researcher yeah. thinks I am looking at the experiment, but quantum physics shows by you looking at the experiment, you've interfered with the experiment. Yeah, the observer effect. So yeah. <clears throat> the observer, the experimenter, is yep. always influencing the outcome of the experiment. So we're not getting a true 
science either from the experiments as long as the person uh, has got an opinion about something before yep. they do the experiment. This is very interesting because I talked to Rupert Sheldrake, which you of course yes. know as well, the morphogenetic field, morphic resonance, and uh, I made a joke with him, which is in fact a very serious thing. I said to him, you know, you British person and you're quite neat and, and the Americans, um, there's a difference in parapsychological outcome of parapsychological studies depending on the fact if it's done in America or in the UK. So yeah. he understood immediately where I want to go to. He said, yes, we're British, we tend not to believe in anything. So, <laughs> so that's interesting. So he actually showed that the Americans who are open to believing some have more outcome in their parapsychological experiments. This yeah. is a study being done than the British. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's, that's your yeah. book. There was a wonderful story, uh, this uh, Marilyn Schlitz, and oh, yeah. she's involved with Noetic no Sciences, and she did an experiment where they had a, a mirror where the, the, ex the experimenter could see through the mirror and watch the people in the room. The people could only see the mirror. Yeah. And what the whole idea of the experiment was is can the experimenter on the other side of the mirror focus on that person and make them do something? Yeah. So she reports that after they do this, they bring a peep person into the room, the person only sees the mirror on the walls, they don't see it, but the other person on the other side of the mirror, the experimenter, influences them to do something, yes. right? And they report in the United States uh, the results that, you know, it worked, it worked this way. A guy in England said, Replication. he said, I, I have the same experiment, I have the same lab, and we tried that experiment and it didn't work. Yeah. So Marilyn said, well, I'll come to England and we'll do it together. Ah, oh, that's interesting. And here was the funny part. Yeah. When she was the one behind the mirror, it worked. When he was the one behind the mirror, it didn't work. Mm. And the point was what? Well, she was ready to believe that this was possible, and he said, no, it was not possible. So when he yeah. went into the experiment, he already said, it's not going to work because I don't believe it. And that's the way the experiment came out. The same with Jacques Benveniste, this woman who all the experiments showed homeopathy really works. Yes, it did. And one woman, so negative probably, I don't want to be around her, hold that thing and effect was gone. Well, that was at uh, the, the um, Buster, what do you call that? Uh, you know, the Psychops, they call them Psychops. They okay. go in there, they, yeah. they try to bust yeah, these yeah. things and show that his name is Randy the Magician. Oh, yeah, yeah, he has his The prices. amazing Randy. Yeah. And he went to Benavenista's lab. Yeah. And the first few times they did the experiment, it worked according just the way Jack Benavenista yeah. showed it. Then what he did is he went around and irritated each of the people that technically bothered them and yeah. got them all jittery like this. Yeah. And then once they were all jittery, he said, okay, do the experiment. And Glenn Rice showed DNA compressors in that yeah. situation, so it doesn't work. And the experiment didn't work. Yeah. So the moment he got them all riled up and got them emotionally off balance, yeah. then the experiment didn't work. Anymore. And he did the same with Uri Geller, I believe, in other psychics, yeah. of course, because he doesn't believe that is real. And the interesting thing, and let's talk about that as well, I think the power of understanding interference effects. Yes. Because the positive interference is a resonance, becomes amplification, right? Yes. And the memory effect of creating a sacred space in a room. But destructive interference actually makes sure that Uri or you cannot do our... Cancels the energy. Cancels it, yes. Yeah, it's called entanglement. Yes. And, and this becomes important because if we look at our bodies, your bodies there, my body here, and we say, okay, we're two separate entities, but I say, well, what about the field, the energy field of John, the energy field of Bruce? Well, yeah. oh, that's like the sea. So we're all entangled in, yeah. in, the, in the sea. Intertwined. So, yeah. So if I get near you and I start to, to get involved with you, my influence and my thoughts can influence your life. Yes. And so this becomes very critical because even though, uh, it's like when they do muscle testing. Yeah, kinesiology. Yeah, yeah the kinesiology. Yeah. Yeah. You say, okay, I'm testing you. So you, you're pushing on my arm and you say you're testing me. Well, it turns out if you already have the answer before you do the test, Mm. You, even though you have the answer and you push on my arm, you're controlling my test. Yeah. So that's why people who sell supplements, yeah. they say, oh, okay, John, here, hold the supplement, let's check your arm. Oh, you see how strong it is? Now here, hold some sugar in your hand. Oh, see how weak it is? Right. So you need to buy my supplements. In fact, I'm not testing you. I, 
I'm the one that has the belief. So even if I'm pushing on your arm, it's my belief that's controlling your arm. Oh, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah so then it says that uh, kinesiology test is influenced by the thoughts of the person who's just doing the pushing on the arm, not the yeah. person you're testing. Like presentiment in parapsychology, it's someone else's presentiment influencing you. Exactly what it's all about. So we have to recognize that you've talked about it, the information field, the noetic field, yeah. that there's information and it's and it's like, look, we're in a room right now with radio broadcasts and television broadcasts and cell phone broadcasts. I say, well, I can't see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're in this room and they influence everything. And, and so it's the invisible information such as these broadcasts yeah. that influence the physical body. Mm -hmm. And this is what the new science is showing. So our mind and our thoughts Mm -hmm. actually are translated into physical responses. What do you think, I think I know the answer a little bit, but is the real biocellular communication between and within cells? I mean, we might call it bioacoustics, biophotonics, bioholographics, but I always joke when I talk about your work, you talk about the membrane, like yeah. a membrane. Yeah. So how do you fit them together, the brain and uh, acoustic waves and light waves and holographic uh, lettuces okay. in, the, in, in the cells. Well, the, the, the skin of the cell mm -hmm. is the barrier between the outside and the inside. Yeah. So if I'm sending information out in the field, like a radio broadcast or television broadcast, I have to pick up the signal mm -hmm. and then translate it into a physical reality. So if I have a television set here, the television set's going to pick up an invisible signal mm -hmm. and then convert that signal into a picture on a screen. Yeah. Okay? A cell is reading the invisible signals but then makes a response that turns it into a physical response. So the membrane of the cell, the brain, mm. is reading the environment and translating it into a biological response. Mm. Your brain in your head is doing exactly the same thing. I he, you know, see you with my eyes, that's light coming in, I hear you with my ears, etc. Mm. This is coming into my brain, my brain then converts that into an experience for me. Okay? Translates it. Translate it. So, uh, yeah, a cell is translating the environment by the use of the membrane, which is the brain, yep. to read the environment, interpret it, yep. and then create a biological response. It's exactly the same thing in our own human body. That's, that's the reason I think I called my book Blueprint, because as a normal neuropsychologist like you coming from regular science, I understood that it's all brain actions and neurotransmitting cells, and then found out, you know what, this world of invisible interference patterns and standing waves of sound, light and energy are more fundamental yes. than this persistent illusion we call matter and cells. But that's what the quantum physics says, and yep. yet quantum physics, when it came in, uh, it was very interesting because, look, if quantum physics was introduced in 1925 as a new idea for the world. Mm -hmm. It was only, what, 15 years from a whole new idea that created an atomic bomb. Isn't it interesting, by the way, it's the same period that the Flexner report came out? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The Flexner report is w the one that, uh, that says that uh, medicine is the only practice and that this is, anybody who practices other than what medicine is being taught is guilty and violating the yeah. rules. And it's, it was a manipulation. Yeah, but before that, homeopathy, uh, digital yes. biology, let's call it... Uh, Even chiropractic started in yeah. 1895. Yeah. And uh, they were doing uh, radionics. Yeah. They were doing all this energy healing. Yeah. And then when the Flexner report came in, all that was made illegal mm. because they were regulating the, the medical people. Now you think, oh, uh, a lot of people think like the American Medical Association, which makes it uh, like, oh, this is, should be your cholesterol level and this should yeah, yeah. be all these things. You think, oh, they're out there to protect the people. It's like, well, that's a joke. They don't understand. The American Medical Association is a union yep. of medical doctors. And as any union, its job is to protect the profession. Yep. So the AMA isn't out here to protect us. The, the AMA interest. is to support the pharmaceutical industry and the medical And there's political entanglement over there as a well. Financial right? and political entanglement. Yeah. Completely. And we saw that in the vaccine story as well. Uh, it plays over and over again. And until we change medicine, you see, here's a simple, from, from my point of view, very yeah. simple truth. The practice of medicine as we see it in Western world today is inhumane. Mm -hmm. Inhumane. And I say that for this reason. The definition of humane, humanity, human, uh, the first definition is compassion. That's what makes us different, that we are compassionate, that if there was someone sick, that we will help that person. And so 
humane means compassion. Take care. Take care. And I say, is the medical profession compassionate? And I go, medical profession is a corporation. Whether it's a pharmaceutical company or the hospital corporation, and I don't food care. Food corporations. Whatever ones there, they're all connected. Yep. And here, and, and the whole idea about it is this: I say, well, then the health profession is a corporation. They make a profit. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're selling stocks. Mm -hmm. So you got you're a shareholder in a drug company. I say, how did you make money? Well, the drug company they sell the drugs. I go, well, who'd they sell them to? I said, sick people. Oh, I said, so you found sick people and now you take money from them. I say, how do you make a profit from sick people? Well, you sell them, uh, you know, a higher price than the service you give them. You give them less service at a higher price and the extra is called profit. Yeah. So I say, well, wait a minute. Compassion, humanity, you're supposed to help sick people. What are you doing? You're penalizing sick people. You're mm -hmm. charging them extra to be sick. Yeah. You're ripping them off. And so the concept of humanity it's not humane to have a medical profession that's, for profit. That's why we have the war on cancer, because if there's a cure, there's no more money coming in for uh, the that's cancer. That's exactly industry. right. And, and after all the years where they say, oh, we're so close, we're so close to the Who's cure. Who's winning? Cancer. And, and every, every time we get, we get close, they throw money in because yeah. they get, and then they disappear, and then they come back later, oh, we're so close, and they get more money. And here's the joke. Today's cancer treatment, after 100 years of funded research and money and money and money, the same, we use the same treatments today as in 1930. Mm -hmm. We give them poison to kill the cell and we give them radiation to kill the cell. Yeah. And with all that research, the, it turns out these are, these are toxic and destructive. If, if I was healthy, mm -hmm. which I am, and I <laughs> took uh, chemotherapy yeah. and radiation treatment, it would make me sick. Well, wait a minute. If I'm healthy and the treatment makes me sick, what happens to a person who's already sick and gets the treatment? Mm. Makes them sicker. Mm. Gets them closer to death. The same with vaccines, in a way. All of it. Yeah. Yeah, I keep away from these things a lot. So, I think your message is we should stop fighting disease but promoting health, I guess? Absolutely, because a, a model that we work with is the disease model, not the health wellness model. And what's the wellness model? It says, look, if you take care of your health, you won't get to the disease state. Mm. And yet, we don't take care of ourselves. You know, it's funny. Most people, if they have a pet like a dog or a cat, they will do everything to take the care of the health of that dog. It's like, oh, the dog needs to go for a walk, the dog needs this, and the dog needs that. When it comes to themselves, they won't do anything for themselves, but mm. they'll do it for the dog. Yeah. And the fact is, we have to take that mentality of taking care of the dog and bring it in, take care of ourselves, yeah. because we're not. Mm. And the lack of taking care of ourselves results in illness. Mm -hmm. So the illness that we have is not organic. We're not, you know, vulnerable and frail like everyone says, like everything should attack us. The only things, the only time we get attacked mm -hmm. is when we're not in health. Isn't one of the big problems, I'm just getting this intuition right now, that we have become conditioned to be disconnected because if we become aware of the connection we have with all kind of species, we automatically have the responsibility to make the right choices. Absolutely, and yet our programming, remember our subconscious yep. programming which is passed through the culture, has always been a program that we are vulnerable, we're frail, that we are weak, that disease comes to us, yep. and if that's what you believe then that's what you open up for your reality. And yet the truth is far from that. Look, uh, people walk across hot coals, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, women uh, in a car accident, if the child is under the car, women, I have reports, women pick up the car themselves yep. to get the child out. You, nobody can go pick up the car, but women can do it. Why? Some women even can drive cars. That's amazing also. <laughs> Why do you say that one, John? <laughs> well, I said it. Let's rewind now. Yeah, and, and, and one, one a very interesting story, which I write about as well, is in the, in the United States we have uh, religious people in the South and they work themselves up into religious ecstasy or something mm -hmm. and they do what they call testify. Testify means I will show you that God protects me. I will do something stupid and God will protect me. Like what? Like some of them play with poisonous snakes. Mm -hmm. And they say, look, God protects me. Even when the snake bites me, I don't get sick. Testimonials. Testimonial. Yeah. Well, the, here's one that I love because I emphasize in the book. Some of them drink strychnine poison. This is toxic poison. Yep. And yet their belief system is God is going to protect me and I will drink this poison and prove that God protects me. They drink strychnine mm -hmm. and they have no harmful effect. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And they'll stop and say, wait a minute, you can drink poison and not have an effect? I go, yeah, because in their mind, they believe that this is not going to hurt them. Yep. That you can lift up a car. If you believe that you've got to lift up the car because your child's under there, the, the, the idea you can't doesn't even come in your mind. Of course I'm going to lift up the car. You know, I'm going to walk across the hot coals. But if I walk in the middle and say, is, uh, is this really hot? At that moment, that's when you will get burned. Yeah, I actually interviewed a guy like that who, who can do that. He's world famous, by the way. You probably know him as well, the Iceman. He's a Dutch guy, Wim uh -huh. Hof. But he can go underwater very cold. He walks marathons. And uh, he can uh, swallow um, dangerous stuff, toxic stuff. And he just shows he can get it out of his system, his immune system, because yeah. he has the conviction that it will not harm him, that it will, he, will, he can get rid of it, and he does. And he's, he's not a superhuman, he's the same as anyone We all have the potential. We're all exactly that same, hmm. except that our belief systems are not the same. Our biology is the same, yeah. our belief systems are different. Yeah. Change the environment, change perception, change reality. There, there you go. And then, and all of a sudden, those magical, mystical things from thousands of years ago, when they talked about these so-called miracle things, yep. uh, were actually doable. Except that most people don't believe that today. Mm -hmm. And since it's based on the belief, if you don't have enough people believe in it, then it can't happen. It's interesting that you you mentioned the word magic because we interviewed a, a, a magician, Ramana. He won the Yuri Geller show. I also uh -huh. talked to Yuri. And uh, he, uh, Romana said something very interesting. You, you probably love this. He says, you know why it's so magical and supernatural to you guys? Because I know the real cause, because I know the secrets, but I just get rid of that real cause, and then you think it's a supernatural effect. Yeah. It's yeah. the new science of new magic, so to speak. So. And that's what uh, uh, I hope people get to learn. That's what I'm trying to get people to understand, yeah. because the only thing we're a victim of is a victim of the belief, not a victim for reality, just because we only believe we're victims. But people still do not believe that we are victims of belief. That's a problem, right? Well, that, that's a problem, because yeah. um, a lot of people say, well, yeah, if that was really true, then my positive thinking should work, and then it doesn't work. And I go, yeah, but... That's because now we know, as I mentioned earlier, we talked about it's it. A it's a case 22, eh? It's only 5% of the time you that the conscious mind yeah. with positive thinking is working. So 95% of your life is coming from the subconscious where there's no positive thinking in there and that. Yeah. So, uh, of course, the positive thinking doesn't work in that case. So all these yeah. different issues, uh, it's just our disbelief. And, and, and uh, here's a, the, the joke. Mm -hmm. The fact is that all these things that I talk about are simple and easy. And they're so easy, you can change your mind, you can change your belief, you can change your life. But we've also been programmed in this world that nothing is easy, that life is hard, you have to struggle. It's like the Protestant work ethic, you must sweat and work hard and work hard. That's a belief. Mm -hmm. So when you are offered something that's easy, the first thing your mind goes is, ah, that can't be true. So when it turns out that, that it's actually easy to control and change our lives, most people will not buy that because their mind doesn't allow easy uh, mm -hmm. and accept easy. Because if it's not hard, then it can't be good. Yep. Some people think if you really work hard, that's when it's going to work. The harder you work at something, the, the you know it's going to be better. And it turns out, no, that's not true. It's, it's that's what they teach in Buddhism as well. That is this this pupil who goes to his teacher, but I'm really going to try hard. And how can I do it faster? Oh, then it will take you two years. No, you don't understand. I'm really going to focus. I'm really going to do my best. Then it will take you five years. No, teacher, you do not. Do it goes on and yeah. on. So yeah, because they don't get it. Yeah. And this is the hard part. We have to wake up. And yeah. uh, that's why I'm very very excited because the new science. People buy science. Yep. We live in the Western world where science is true. The new science offers a, a new truth. That's interesting. So the new science is offering new truth. And because there's a new truth, it becomes a new belief system. And then it's not science again, then it's belief again. But real science, which we have now, is in a way a belief system in itself, but based on the wrong assumptions, right? Well, that's right, because the experimenter is, is uh, based the experiment on their belief. That's why they yep. design the experiment. Well. So, we started with the fact that, let me get it here, that you are bridging science and spirit. So here we are, I think, at, at, at the end. Um, well, we are entangled now. Let, let me thank you for this talk. Well, I so appreciate that. I really want to thank everyone out there for this reason, yep. is that everyone out there is part of this change. And if you're actually watching this video, you're part of what we call cultural creatives, people who are thinking 
outside of the box, people who are looking for other answers. This is where the truths are going to come from. It's not going to come from inside the box. It's coming from outside. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of us are outside the box, and we have a much better opportunity to, to live on this planet in health and happiness and harmony than those people inside the box. Amen. We're talking about inside as above, so below, so within, so without. Here's the book. This is the Dutch one, the Biologie van de Overtuiging, Ank Hermes Uitgeverij. Uh, the English title would be Translation Biology of Belief uh, by Hay House, I believe, am I correct? Yeah. Yes. So BruceLipton.com to go to all the brilliant information that is out on the website, the books and the DVDs and more information. My information is on HealingSoundMovement.com, WorldPeaceChild.com. Uh, my name is John Consmulder, this is still Bruce Lipton. We had a great time and thank you and up to the next episode. Thank you. Yeah, but there's one thing I want to do off camera, so to speak. Uh, I talked to Piotr Garyaev, and he also talks, and I thought it was amazing after all this DNA phantom and all the biophysics, and then I suddenly just saw one word in his presentation, and it said, exobiological. And I see you glimpse here, and I, I said to him, I know that word, you're just saying one word, but are you actually giving a small glimpse of a higher reality? Are you actually talking about extraterrestrials? Because that's the word, right? Exobiology. And I said, I couldn't believe what I just read, just one sentence. So, and I see you, 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 you glimpsing a little bit as well. So what's your view about this? Um, we don't put it in the, in the show probably, but yeah. this, is, this is off camera. But angels, higher beams, extraterrestrials, yeah. because if we're all consciousness, yeah. and we are infinite consciousness, yeah. of course. Where the hell are we? Yeah. In other words, I know my body is right here, but where's the broadcast coming from that's being picked up by the antennas on my The higher self. I have no idea where that is. It's not localized anywhere. So the significance mm. is, where is it? It doesn't have to be here. And the fact is, are there aliens? Of course there's got to be aliens. I mean, only an idiot would think that only one planet in, in um, a solar, you know, solar system or a, a galaxy and a, and a universe that is so big beyond your belief, you, you couldn't even imagine. Beyond your belief. <laughs> uh, that we'd be the only one. It'd be stupid. Yeah. And then you say, but why are, why are we having, you know, why are we seeing them very much? And I, because the answer is, we are not born yet. We are not born the super organism called humanity. Mm. So they, they're not going to talk to us as individuals, they're going to talk to us as humanity, mm. as a group. And well, maybe even extraterrestrials are a future representation of us as evolved super beings. Yeah. Yeah. That's also another yeah. possibility. Some and, uh, and as I said, I think this is just a, a great physical opportunity to be on this planet because uh, my spiritual self has awareness, but it doesn't have sensory. Mm -hmm. there, there's no nervous system in a, in a spiritual awareness. It has an awareness, that's what my nervous system is translating this physical experience into awareness, but I'm sending information without cells, that's just a fiat. Yep. So uh, the concept of having a body and cells uh, and sensing things and smelling and tasting and touching and feeling, yep. it's like, that you can do here, you can't do yep. in that spiritual domain. So it's like, and then think about it, so I, well, that's what hit me, the first thing, as I said, is like, uh, why have both a spirit and a body? And I said, because yep. uh, the, uh, you can't taste chocolate, you can't see a sunset, you can't be you in You can't move around boxes. You can't, you can't create without that, yep. you know? So, and I thought, oh my God, the whole idea is to sense this planet. And yep. then I go back and go, well, here's the interesting part. As men, when we were young, the males, were the ones that were learned not to be sensitive. Mm. You know, where we learned, oh, don't, you, can, you, you can hit me and I won't cry, and you can do these things and I won't make an emotional response. So we took out in our growing up mm. sensitivity. Yeah. And then we grow up and then, of course, the women around go, you're so insensitive, you know, you're insensitive loud. I know, I took it out, woman. Uh, that's a problem, <laughs> and that's the problem, because it was programmed out of us yeah. uh, so that we would be more uh, useful as... Uh, the feminine aspect. Yeah. Take that out, because yeah. of, for war and violence and all that other kind of stuff, they groomed us for that. Yeah. And I realized, oh my God, we were here mainly to have these experiences, and the first thing that happened to us as kids is we programmed that out of our, mm. we're, our we're not going to make a response. Yep. And it was like, my God, we wasted all those years where we could have been enjoying the, 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 the pleasure of this entire planet, but yep. we shut it off. 
I always call that the Avatar consciousness, like the movie Avatar, yeah. without the army and the military yeah. aspects, but the connection and the way they are in that field, literally connected, and using sound as a, a carrier wave of consciousness, yeah. and they're connecting and they're feeling for this person to, to, to come alive for the planet. That's that's what I call the, the Gaia hypothesis of Loveland. Yeah. That's it. If you know you are connected, you don't have to study it, you, you just know, yeah. because it's basic conditioning and you just know that you connected to the animal kingdom to humans to other species the mother gaia maybe to other planets in the cosmos then it becomes as above so below so within so without yeah. then you make the right choices as a normal perspective a normal outcome of any of, of any problem there are no problems as long as you try to solve them from the the same perspective yeah. right so yeah. that's a, you got enough yes here <laughs> Hello! Thank you! <laughs> Thank you wow, that was amazing! Yeah, it was good!